Thank you, Melissa. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church. It's great to see all of you today. We continue our uh, study of what we're calling ministry clarity targets, but they really flow directly from our readings, and the readings align very nicely. Today we have Jesus teaching his disciples. It's a rather private instruction. Uh, and it reflects a shift in his ministry to really focusing on Christian education with his closest ones, his 12 disciples. Uh, and it's a great text to springboard. And we're going to discover that one of the key things that Jesus is doing is he's actually walking through life, teaching them. It was a moving catechism class, uh, and that's what we see in the life and ministry of Jesus with his 12 disciples. We also celebrate um, Holy Communion today, and we would encourage you all to uh, um, read the communion statement in the beginning uh, in your bulletin to prepare for that celebration of the Lord's body and blood received in, with, and under the bread and wine. The opening hymn is uh, Sing to the Lord of the Harvest. We will sing this together, hymn 893, verses 1 and 3. rise. We follow our worship service on uh, page 167 in your hymnal, Divine Service Setting 2. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And before the general confession, let us take a moment and silently confess those sins that weigh upon our heart today. Let us confess our sin to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways for the glory of your holy name. Amen. 
Almighty God in his mercy has given his only begotten son to die for you and for me. And for his sake, he forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. We read responsively Psalm 54. It's on page 3 in your bulletin. Save me, God, by your name, and vindicate me by your power. Hear my prayer, God. Listen to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me, and violent men have sought my life. They have not set God before them. Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the sustainer of my soul. He will pay back the evil to my enemies. Destroy them in your faithfulness. Willingly I will sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, Lord, for it is good. For he has saved me from all trouble, and my eye has looked with satisfaction upon In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. the Lord be with you. And also with you. The collect for today is on page five in your bulletin near the top. And when we pray for our teachers, part of the message today is that we are all teachers, so we're also praying for each of us. We go to our Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ teacher, teacher, may we, we continue, continue in, in your word and therefore, and therefore prove to be your, your disciples. Bless our walking with students, that we would hear their faith discussions and show our love by sowing the gospel in peace. We thank you, Lord, for the courage and faithfulness of the congregation and your provision so that we have two full-time preschool and after-school teachers. Continue and guide our stewardship of Christian education. Bless our teachers in their instruction, their love for children, and the way that they reveal Christ, that they are full of mercy and good fruits, and bless the children with hearts that are open to reason. Give us guidance now in the future as your church, 
that we might know how to communicate the cross and the empty tomb of Christ in all of our educational ministries. May we see the harvest of righteousness through the profession of faith. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 11, verses 18 through 20. The Lord made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not know it was against me. They devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be, may be remembered no more. But, O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tests the heart and the mind. Let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you have I committed my cause. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is taken from James chapter 3, verse 13, to chapter 4, verse 10. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war with you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You do not ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the Lord is enmity with God? Excuse me. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealousy, jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God imposes the proud, opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the verse of the day and our gospel reading. At the bottom of page 5 in your bulletin, you'll find today's verse from Mark 9, verse 33. Please join with me as we read this verse together. We read, They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them, What were you discussing on the way?
Holy Gospel for the 17th Sunday after the celebration of Pentecost is recorded in Mark chapter 9, beginning at the 30th verse. Glory to you. The disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee, and Jesus did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last and servant of all. And he took a child, and he put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Our sermon hymn is uh, Let the Children Hear the Mighty Deeds. We're going to let the vocalists sing this hymn, 867. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of Jesus, the greatest teacher, because he taught with every fiber of his being, every moment of his earthly life, and continues to teach us through his word. Jesus is called teacher at least 50 times in the Gospels. Sometimes he did refer to himself as teacher, especially that one comment when he said, one is your teacher, referring to himself. And many times other people called him teacher. The first time that Jesus was ever called teacher in the Gospels is in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 8. It is both ironic and revelatory because it's a scribe who first calls him teacher. And he says, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And you may recall that the scribes were not always on the side of Jesus. And so it's interesting and somewhat ironic that it is a teacher, uh, it's a scribe who calls him teacher. But Jesus taught absolute law and absolute gospel. And the scribes didn't teach that. They taught something that was watered down, not something that was rock hard and absolute in either department. Revelation, though, is in Jesus' answer. 
Jesus, you may recall, after the scribe says, I'll follow you wherever you go, says, well, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It's a bit of a double answer. He's telling him that, okay, you want to follow me? Be ready for a rough life. I don't have a place to lay my head. I don't really have a home. Be ready sort of for a homeless mobile mission. But he's also saying that I have that lifestyle because I'm fully invested in kingdom work. If you want to follow this mission, this teacher, then be ready to have your school take place every single day wherever you happen to walk. You will be teaching as you go. So one of my great teachers, and I'll be talking about a few of them in this message, was Vince O'Donnell. I have no idea if Vince was a Christian or not. He certainly had the fruit that seemed to be. He was my sociology teacher in high school. And it was mostly fear that motivated seniors in Vince O'Donnell's class. Uh, and it just created that aura. You better learn if you're in his class. And there was one seemingly obvious point that he would drive home on a regular basis. He would say this, and this is verbatim, Children learn behaviors they see practice. Seems obvious, right? You see it on a regular basis, you learn it. And parents, psychologists tell us, are the most influential teachers of all upon children, even today. So we are going to be teaching as we go in life, and you are especially teaching when you are around children. We're teaching what we believe. And people will see that. They will see what we believe in the desires that we have from life and in life. They will see what we believe in our ethics and our morals and our priorities, in our stewardship life. They will see how we express our love and our forgiveness. And they will also see what we are willing to sacrifice. Life is teaching. We teach as we live, and the question is, what are we teaching? In Mark chapter 9, Jesus has shifted his attention in his teaching. He used to be doing a lot of public preaching, teaching, and miracles. And now in the second half of Mark and in most of the Gospels, you're going to see Jesus now focus in on his own 12 disciples. He's getting ready for them to take over the work that he will accomplish at the empty tomb, and they're going to be his witnesses. So had a recent discussion, actually, with several of our members about teaching. Technical word is pedagogy. Uh, and by the way, the word is almost completely transliterated from the Greek, and it simply means to lead a child. I was reminded in this discussion back when I was learning in psychology, both in uh, undergraduate and then graduate work, uh, that the primacy and recency effect is still important, and a good part of teaching is what comes first is usually the important thing and the thing that is retained by your students. The most important thing that Jesus taught was that he was there to do the work of salvation. He is, as John the Baptist announced, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's his main job as the Christ. And so in our reading today, you hear that prioritized is Jesus takes his disciples aside and says, I want you to get this. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. It's not the first time that Jesus has had this teaching. If you look at Mark 8 and 9, this is actually uh, the third time that he has taught it. And he teaches it four different times in those two chapters. The first time, Jesus gives a specific prophecy in the gospel, and Mark says he was stating the matter plainly. This is after the, uh, the time that Peter gave his great confession and said, no, you don't really want to go to the cross. <laughs> when St. Luke records one of these prophecies of his death and resurrection, Luke says in Luke 9.44, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed, betrayed and delivered in the hands of men. What is up with the emphasis of Jesus upon his own death and resurrection? 
Well, I want you to realize that as a follower of Christ, this is really the centerpiece. This is the seed from which all the fruit of faith flows. We are created in Christ Jesus, is what Paul says, and out of that creation, everything else flows. It is the foundation of faith, is what is written in Ephesians. You are built upon this. It is our ontology. It is the orb of orientation, the hub of the wheel. Everything else in life flows around it. In Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who lives, it is Christ who lives in me. In this life I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It gives me my direction and purpose. It is also the mortar of meaning that holds our life together. When we are in weal or woe, in times of suffering or celebration, and Paul would say this on his great sermon on Mars Hill, in him we live and move and have our being. It's all about being in a relationship with our crucified and risen Lord, and it changes the way we live. So I want you to think for a moment about how does this message of Jesus as our Savior, the one who died for us and rose again, affect your own life, your own orientation, the way you teach, the way you give your example, the way you walk with people, whether they be your children, your neighbors, your colleagues, your coworkers, your fellow students. How does that change? What does it mean for you? So I've got simply three observations from the reading today that I want to share how it affects my life, and I think it probably affects your life the same way. It means that we live with accountability. He did all that because we kind of messed up. Believing in that means that we also can get over our guilt, a second and really critical thing. And then it also means, of course, with the resurrection, that you hold on to hope no matter what the circumstances are. Some of you know the story of the sinker that used to sit on my desk. Uh, the story was uh, from my childhood, uh, and one of my great teachers was my Uncle Frank. And Uncle Frank was himself a teacher. He taught high school shop and woodworking, was a master woodworker. And I spent a lot of time growing up in uh, southern Michigan at the cottage where my grandpa had a cottage and then my uncle had a trailer and then later on my parents had a cottage when I was older. And over the course of the summer, you'd take a lot of trips into the city. Sometimes we went to the big Kmart. Well, because we were doing a lot of fishing and we walked through the fishing department, I was intrigued by this little lead sinker with a brass swivel top and I thought that was really cool. And instead of having the humility and the courage to ask Uncle Frank if he could pony up the 15 cents that it probably caught, I don't know what it cost, but it wasn't much, I just looked around and said, yeah, I could just stick this in my pocket, which I did, and we walked out to the front of the store, at which point Uncle Frank turned to me and said, Robbie, let's go talk to the manager. Maybe Uncle Frank couldn't find a fishing piece of equipment that he wanted. So we walked over there, and I, uh, doing a poor job of acting, looked innocent. He said, Robbie, why don't you open up your pockets and show the manager what's in there? There was still that sinker. I hadn't repented and put it back. And so after an incredibly shameful and awkward time of confessing my sin now publicly before the manager, Uncle Frank said, I'll buy the sinker. And then he said, don't forget this. I have it. That story is very similar to Jesus confronting the disciples. What were you discussing along the way? He knew very well what they were discussing. He had just finished previously telling them that he was going to die for them, be buried, be resurrected, and they're worried about who's the greatest. Well, the answer is Jesus is the greatest, okay? So if you're worried about the superlative, forget about it. You're not going to be there. He is the greatest. He lived the only perfect life. He lived the perfect sacrificial death. He lived with integrity. Part of this illustration, I think, is realizing that as we are traveling, we're teaching. What were you discussing along the way? 
I find it interesting that we need to talk about the things that people are talking about and do it in a way that brings them back to Jesus. What does it have to do with your accountability? That's at least part of his message. So the disciples, as you know, were silent. Well, you know they're silent. Mark gives the explanation because they knew they were guilty. That's good news. They at least were embarrassed that they had done the wrong thing. And that's a good thing when you realize that you've got guilt. You acknowledge that what you've done wrong is, in fact, wrong. And yet we still do it every day. The cross of Christ, his main teaching, reminds us that at the end of our life, we will be held accountable. And you've got a perfect picture of all humanity on Mount Calvary. You've got two thieves. We're all guilty. And yet one who rejected Christ ended up in abject rejection himself. And the other who simply said, remember me, said, okay, you'll get heaven. It is that simple. So the second story about absolution, about forgiveness, revolves around another great teacher, my mom. And it's a simple story. There's not a lot of details to it. It involves my middle school years, when I was uh, doing some shenanigans and didn't always have the best attitude. And I was aware of this. And I was pretty sure that I was going to get the talk when she said, let's go to lunch. We went to the Peachtree Inn in Bay Village, Ohio. It's no longer there. Shocking. The reason I remember the story is that she didn't bring up any of the stuff that I was quite sure she was going to bring up. We just had lunch, and she was pleasant. I remember the grace. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus wants us to remember the grace and walk in that grace. James, who had all those condemnatory things to say in chapter 3 of his epistle, also said in chapter 1, mercy triumphs over judgment. God's power to forgive is greater than the guilt that you carry. That's why Jesus came. And so you live your life teaching about mercy and love and forgiveness and what it means to have the joy of Christ because every day you're forgiven. Boy, does our world need that teacher. I'm a big fan of Lutheran schools. I oftentimes say Mr. Berger changed my life. So the urban legend, according to my mom, I think it's true, but the urban legend was I was kicked out of public school in third grade. So if you ask my mom today, she's still alive. She would probably deny that. But that's, the, that's what I remember as a kid in third grade. You know? You've been so bad, you're out of here. But there was this place called Our Redeemer Lutheran School. The place that we went to church also had a parochial school. Mr. Berger was a first-year teacher for fourth grade. How did Mr. Berger change my life? Because all the shenanigans that I was guilty of later, I was really guilty of it as a third and fourth grader. I was just constantly trying to push his buttons. I remember this. His love was greater than my shenanigans. And I began to see Christ in his persistent loving me and forgiving me and building me up. Years later, I wrote Mr. Berger. He was still at the same school at the end of his teaching career. He said, you know what? I didn't teach fourth grade again until right now this year. I don't know if I took it out of him or not. But he was back in, and he could see the fruit of his labor. That's one of the reasons we do what we do in preschool and after school, so that those kids can have that memory. In today's epistle, James would say, the wisdom from above is full of mercy. It's sincere. It's not fake. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You teach by your peacemaking. That's what we are. So as I remember my mom and I remember Mr. Berger, I remember the grace, as I remember Uncle Frank, he held me accountable and taught me that I need to be accountable every day. 
And by that accountability, I remember the mercy of Christ. And the last illustration involves my dad. My dad was a sales manager for TRW, a company that did a whole lot, a lot of technology. The division that he worked with was primarily in selling welding equipment to those uh, auto manufacturers. And those with uh, a knowledge of history or those who lived through it remember that when the uh, gas crisis hit and we were all driving big V8s from Detroit, they weren't selling very well. And so my dad's company uh, was really struggling. And my dad would rarely share, share struggles at work. And when he did, I figured it was a teachable moment. And he told us a story. He said, you know what? Layoffs are coming. He said, we're talking about how to cut back to save jobs, so how we can be efficient. Uh, and he said, we were in a meeting today. And he said, we were talking about where we were going to cut back. And I, I, he told me in first person, I, I said to the people at that meeting, well, why don't we sell more? It seemed to be an oxymoron. And yet nobody was talking about hope and growth and potential. You see, when you have a Lord who conquered sin, death, and rose from the dead, all things are possible. And that affects the way you teach and the way you live. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That taught me faith and hope. I won't forget that story. When things are bleakest, there is power available to us. Even the grave, Christ has conquered death. Christians live in hope. That's what we do. That's what we teach. The last thing I'll leave you with is this curious verse at the end of our reading. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. It's actually a pretty difficult passage that Jesus is teaching. One thing is obvious, that you, when, when you receive a person, you receive them as Christ receives people. So Jesus is the one who's picking up this child, and Mark makes a point to say he's hugging him. So you receive everybody with love as Christ receives people. And I think he's also teaching that when you receive them that way, you receive him. You treat everyone as though they are Christ, and you treat everyone as though you are touching them in the name of Christ. You are his apostle. You are sent by him to be him. And that's why Christ changes everything. So as we leave today and we think about what it means to be an educator and sometimes focus education, like in Lutheran education or at least Christian education, you leave knowing that you're always accountable every day. That's what it means to teach. You're always graceful and walk in grace every day. And you always walk in hope in the most hopeless situations. Amen. Now may the peace of God that goes beyond what we understand stand guard of our hearts and minds to keep us strong in Jesus Christ, our living Lord. Amen. And let us all rise and sing the last two verses of hymn 867. We sing this one together. Let children hear the mighty deeds. Verses 4 and 5.
now profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 6 and 7 in your bulletin. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten of Son of God, begotten of his Father before of all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the light of the world to come. Amen. This time we gather your offerings and prayers. There's an orange card in front of you. If you have a prayer request for worship, fill it out and give it to the children. If it's a private prayer request, fill out the back and drop it in the box when you leave today. You may be seated. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, teacher, you taught us in word and deed. Your life was one of complete faith. You didn't have a place to live. You just trusted in the Father to provide during your ministry. You lived the perfect life of love. You taught us by always doing the right thing. You taught us by being long-suffering and finally giving up your life as a sacrifice for others. And ultimate, Lord, you taught us to live in hope because of the resurrection. We pray, Lord, that as we live our life as teachers, as we come alongside those around us, that we would always teach them accountability, grace, and hope. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, in our prayers today, we remember uh, Hope Russell's mom, Gloria Russell, who has been having some serious struggles with her breathing. 
Um, we also remember Bob Peckins, who is in the midst of his chemotherapy, and Carla N., who's in the midst of her radiation treatments. So uh, we go to our Lord with these prayers. Please rise for these prayers. Lord God Almighty, you are the Lord of life. You know how to heal bodies. We call upon you always in times of affliction for healing according to your will. We pray, Lord, for those saints that we have mentioned in our prayers, Gloria, Bob, and Carla. We pray that you would give to each of them the healing that is right for them at this time and abide with them, Lord, through your word and Holy Spirit that they may have comfort and peace to remember that they are not alone, but the good shepherd abides with them. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. We've got our orange cards. So in our orange cards, we also remember Emma, who is our confirmand, who is turning 13 tomorrow. Happy birthday, Emma. And also the Terry family prayers for Aiden uh, Ladeau, who was taken to the hospital with breathing problems, and for parents Kim and Jason, that is their grandchild. Um, continued prayers for the Wisher family. So those who don't know, our president of our Eastern District, Chris Wisher, and his wife, Bev, um, their oldest son, Tim, was found uh, unconscious at home and has been in ICU receiving uh, serious treatment. So we pray for these saints. Lord God Almighty, we pray that you would be with uh, little baby Aiden Ladeau as he struggles in the hospital. We pray, Lord, for your blessing upon the breathing, that it would be restored, and for strength and healing according to your will and mercy. We give you thanks, Lord, for Emma and her presence among us, and we pray that you would bless her not only as a student of the word, but bless her as she turns 13. May her 13th year be one of great joy as she uh, lives her life of faith before others. We pray, Lord, that you would be with uh, Tim Wisher, who has, as my last word on this, has remained in ICU. We ask, Lord, for your mercy, that you would touch him with healing and strength. Be with his mom and dad, uh, that they would not be anxious, but cast their anxiety upon you, that they may all live in hope and faith. In your name we pray, amen. We now prepare for Holy Communion with the preface. It's on page 7 in your bulletin. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is It is truly good, right, and proper, Lord, that we should always give you thanks and praise, especially during this season of Pentecost, as we, we realize that you have given us of yourself. As baptized saints, we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit abiding with us every day. Therefore, we evermore praise you, and we sing. heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created, and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and blood and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own words. 
Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful marriage feast of the Lamb in His kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers and deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had supped and given thanks, he gave it to them and he said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and you're coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be, be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. of Christ, given it to death for your sins. Now may this, our Lord's true body and blood, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting, go with great grace, peace, joy, and hope. Amen. We rise. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Any announcements we have? As missions chair, I am coming to, to you <laughs> to take up a special collection for our neighbor congregations in the Atlantic District who have been so affected by the tropical storm Ida. 15 churches experienced flooding and 20 workers' homes were affected as well as many members of the congregations. 
Trinity has decided to do no more than three special collections in a year. If you would like to help, you can donate via check to Trinity, and in the memo, in the memo please put disaster response. The uh, handout you guys got this morning tells you a little bit more, and um, it would be greatly appreciated if you help. Thank you. And Vivian is from Long Island, so she knows about the effect in that area. Uh, and Vivian, again, when will that fundraiser end? I've forgotten. About a month. Okay. Thank you for that. Well, let's rise and now go with God's blessing in our closing hymn, which we will sing together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.